Let's start with what is relational databases and what is MySQL? A relational database simply is a collection of data items with predefined relationships between them. These items are organized as set of tables with columns and rows. Tables are used to hold information about the objects to be represented in the database. Assume that we have an employee, Jennifer, for example. Jennifer has a first name, last name, of course, and the first date, building number she's living in, street, city, a job, a company, hire date, and the job itself has some information. The job name, the minimum salary, the maximum salary, and other elements that we can add. If you think of it, there is some kind of relation between all of this information. So we can say there is a group of data or a table for the information about Jennifer by the first name, last name, and the birth date. And we can add some other elements like the email, phone number, nationality, and many, many others. We can have another table for the addresses, which will recall all the addresses where Jennifer is living, the building, the street, the city, because these items can change. It's linked with the first table of the first name and last name using the ID. This ID can be a social security number or a random generated number. We can have another table for the jobs. The job, the company, the hire date, and we can have another table for the information about the job itself. Containing information like the minimum salary for the job, the maximum salary, the requirements, and many others. What is SQL? SQL or Structured Query Language, it's pronounced as SQL or SQL, is the primary interface used to communicate with relational databases. SQL is the standard language for relational databases management systems such as the PostgreSQL, MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, and MariaDB, and many others. SQL statements are used to perform tasks such as update data on the database or retrieve data from the database. There is many other statements like the select, delete, insert, create, drop, and many others. And we will ex be exploring a lot of these commands in the upcoming lectures. Now let's see how can we install the MySQL. We need to go to this URL in here, dev.mysql.com slash downloads, or simply type in Google MySQL download and go to the first link, which is the MySQL downloads. We can download the paid editions of the MySQL, but we're going to go for the community edition. This is a free edition of the MySQL. Choose the community server. Go down and choose your operating system. There is a bunch of them in here. I'm going to choose Windows, but I'm going to press this icon or this button in here. Go to the download page. Then go down and choose from these two options. The this is the smaller one. I'm going to use this one. This is the web, as you can see in here, MySQL installer web community and MySQL installer community. I'm going to choose the smaller one and download it. I have it already downloaded in here, so I'm going to choose it. Run. Now the installer will be launched. Here it is. I'm going to leave it for the developer default. It's going to install a couple of things that I need. The MySQL server, of course, this is the most important one. And the MySQL Workbench. This is the graphical user interface that we will be using to interact with the MySQL database itself. Go ahead and press next. If you'd like to check this requirement, as you can see, the following products have failed, require that installment will attempt to resolve. It's not actually important. Leave it for now. Press next. Yes, okay. If you have something like that, just leave it. Not important, we can fix it later. Here is what's happening. It's being installed right now. Here it is. All the features that we're going to install and the percentage of each one. Here it is. Installing the connectors here, as you can see, this is the files that we can use to connect to, as you can see, the different, if you're using a.NET, C Sharp, or VB.NET, or the Java, or Python. 
that's being loaded as well. On the shell, the utilities, the workbench. As I mentioned, this is the uh, the GUI, the graphical user interface that we will be using, and I like it actually, it's very powerful. Okay, I will leave it and go ahead also as well, relax until all the installations are done. Okay, now the installation is done, let's go ahead and press next. Next. Go ahead and choose standalone MySQL server. Go ahead and leave all of this option. The root in here, this will be like the administrator user to configure and do almost everything to the MySQL database. Go ahead and choose the password for it. Mine will be weak, I know. Here it is. It's not that important for me right now because I'm just using this as training. It's not an actual server. If you run a real environment, you need to make this, of course, a powerful password. Leave all of this as it is. Click next, next, execute. It's finished. Click finish, next. Leave all of this as it is. Just click next. And we need to give the password for the root user that we've just chosen. Check. Yes, as you can see here, connection succeeded. Old connection succeeded. So we'll go ahead and click execute. I know it's some pouring configuration, but it will be done. Next. And now we are done. Installation complete. We can either start the MySQL workbench or the shell. I'm going to choose start my MySQL workbench. Finish. It should display the workbench right now. Here it is. Here is the application that we're going to use to do almost everything to the MySQL database. Next, we're going to explore some of the features of the workbench. See you in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to explore some of the features of the MySQL workbench. In the previous lecture, we have seen how to install the MySQL and the MySQL workbench. As you can see in here, the workbench is the official graphical user interface tool for the MySQL. It allows you to design, create, and browse your database schemas, work with database objects, and insert as well as design and run SQL queries. And we'll see all of this and even more, so don't hurry. Now, let's see how to connect to the MySQL. As you can see in here, there is this default MySQL connection. It's named Local Instance MySQL router let's go ahead and click it you can see some of the information in here double click on it and it's asking me for the password i'm going to give it the password here it is and we are connected congratulations let's take some of the main features in here from the first in here server status you can see the server status from here as you can see, it's green, and the play icon in here, it means it's running. You can find some information about the name, dev-courses-vm, this is actually my computer name, or the server name if you're working on a server. And here is the port, the version that we're using, the MySQL community server, and some other information actually where it is installed, the free space. If we go down, we can see here all the connections that are connecting to my SQL server right now. Here are the users and privileges. From here, we can manage to add users or remove users, give them certain permissions or remove from them certain permission as we're going to see in the upcoming lecture. As you can see here with the root, these are the default that are already installed with the my SQL. We didn't create any of these. Let's go to take a look at the data export. We can, of course, one of the amazing features with the MySQL workbench that we can export data to different types. You can export it to an access database or an Excel file. It's very flexible. Or we can do the opposite. We can import data from these types. Here is the instance. You can stop the server. As you can see, it's running now. If you'd like to do some maintenance or anything, you can stop it or you can bring it offline. Bring it offline will not stop it but it will make it offline it will make the connection to it unavailable 
can go in here for the performance you're going to check this nice dashboard in here telling you about the efficiency about the server and the connection that's receiving and sending really nice information you can see now let's go to the important part in here you can find the schema the databases itself you can find Sakalia, or i don't know how to pronounce it actually this is a database and it's told already with us from the sql server you can see the database in here the actor the address the category the city the country the customer if we open this for example you can go ahead and right click and select rows and here it is there is some information in here nick add jennifer this is all ready for us so that we can make relations, add items, remove items, or we can practice SQL queries on them. We don't need to design any of these, of course, they are available. They are built in tables to allow you. And we're going to explore some of these features later. So you can see here is also the wallet database. If you open the tables, we have the cities and countries. We can open the country. Go ahead and right click, select rows, and here it is. Don't mind all of this code, we're going to master all of this code. The select, the insert, the add, just uh, breaking the ice with the MySQL workbench. So don't mind any code or anything that you don't understand. We're going to go through all of these features one by one. As you can see, here is some data. Actually, that's a really cool data for all the countries, as you can see. Go down, find the continent in it, the region, the population, the, all of this information are available for us from the MySQL built in databases when we installed it. I think it's very nice. This was just an introduction to the workbench. I hope it cracked the eyes with it. Go ahead, play with this application for a while, get used to it. Next, we're going to see how to install. MySQL on the cloud. See you in the next lecture. Okay, now let's see how can we create MySQL database on Microsoft Azure. First, you need to go to this link in here, azure.microsoft.com. It's free, of course. Go ahead and press start free. Again, start free. The Microsoft Azure works as the following. It's going to give you 12 months of free services and it will give you $200 to spend on Microsoft Azure, not on any other thing. You cannot spend, of course, this 200s on Amazon or any, on eBay or any other website. Only on the services of the Azure, only for 30 days. Go ahead and click Start Free. Go ahead and it's just a basic sign up and maybe the interesting part only that it will ask you about your Visa card or MasterCard and it will charge you only $1. Only this. And as we're going, if you need to use other services, you will be paying, but don't be worried. We'll not be using any paid services in this course. So go ahead and create a Microsoft account if you don't have one and create a Microsoft Azure account as well. I'll be waiting in here to see how can we create the MySQL database on the Azure. Okay, I hope the steps are easy. Now let's go ahead to this URL portal.azure.com you should see something like this when you add this URL in here so this is mainly the dashboard and the GUI that you will be able to create resource and manage any resource that you are going to create first we can go ahead and change the theme I know people like to change the theme so we can choose from these colors you can make it white or black or high contrast theme I'm gonna just leave it well, the default you can go ahead and change it as you want the dashboard itself is editable as you can see in here you can edit dashboard and start editing your dashboard on the left in here here is some of the services of the microsoft other they are not all of the services if you would like to see all of the services you can come in here and choose all services and here is all the services categorized by the genre storage web databases etc you can go ahead and edit the dashboard and you can as you can see you can resize your items you can add even items from here into the dashboard maybe the marketplace i don't know just go ahead and play with it it's fun to play with it 
Okay, now let's go ahead and try to create the MySQL database. I'm gonna choose create a resource. From here, I'm going down to the databases. Go ahead and choose here is actually it's in front of it. Other database for MySQL. Go ahead and choose it. Now go ahead and give the server name. I'm gonna call it maybe. Go ahead and give it any name. Your name maybe. I'm gonna choose my name. Let MySQL server. Yes, it's valid. The subscription, as you can see here, it's a free trial. We'll not be charging anything. The resource group actually is a collection of resources that share the same lifecycle permission and policies. We're not going to create a lot of resources right now, so go ahead and create a new one. Maybe name it uh, resource one. This is the login name that we'll be using. We can name it root or you can name it anywhere. No, we cannot name it root actually. It cannot be named all of these names as you can see in here. Road, guest, public, admin, administrator. Go ahead and choose maybe again your name or any names that you would like. So it's not it's not able for us to name it road. Okay, that's very important. I'm gonna give it my name. Go ahead and choose a password. Please remember this password. Don't forget it. And the location that this server will be located, and we can go ahead and leave it as West Europe. Or where you are just leave it as it is i'm going to use the 5.7 version this is the last one available for me the pricing tier this is very important we can come in here and choose the basic we can see here this is the the pricing unit as you can see it's calculating for me how much money i'll be paying as you can see in here but i'm just gonna leave it as a default and again don't worry you'll not be charging anything We'll be deleting all of these resources once we are finished, and we already have two hundred dollars when we created this account. So go ahead and choose OK. Now create. You can pin this to the dashboard if you'd like. Okay, I'm gonna choose it. I'll click it. Create. Validating. It depends on your internet connections. Here it is, and it's pinned to my dashboard as I told it. Deploying Microsoft other database for my SQL. Go ahead and click it. It will be deploying duration 12 seconds. I don't know if it will be finished in the 12 seconds or not. Oh, that's actually the 12 seconds that's already taking. Okay, I will just leave it until it's finished and I'll be back. Okay, now the database is created successfully. As you can see, the status is succeeded in here. It took 3 minutes and 19 seconds, which is very good, I think. And as you can see in the notifications, deployment succeeded. And we can go to the resource. Also, you should see something like this. You have in your credit remaining, you should see something around $200. So now let's go to the database itself. Here it is. Close the notification. And here is the server name, and we can connect to it using the MySQL Workbench. We're going to see this in a bit. You can see the login name. Here it is. Here is the name that is specified at, and the server name, and the version, and almost everything you can see in here. As you will be adding items, you will see the resource utilization. You can see here the security. And we'll go to this tab. I will tell you why in a bit the connection string if you are going to connect to the other.net or the jdbc or the node.js or the odbc or php python rupee or another web app that's actually very nice to have you can just come in here and copy the connection string of the other.net for example now let's go ahead and see how can we connect to this database from the sql work or the mysql workbench so go ahead and copy the server name from here i'll be creating a new connection here it is this is the connection name this is not the server name on the cloud you can name it 
any, you can name it X, you can name it anything. I'm gonna give it a name our MySQL database. The host name actually, this IP actually in here, this is a local. When you see this, this means that this is the local machine that you're working in. So here it is, I copied the server name, and in here, as you remember, we didn't use the root, we used another user. Go ahead, take it from here. I hope you remember the password. Press on this button here, store in vault, and go ahead and give it the password that we've created. Okay, and let's test the connection. It's going to be successfully made the MySQL connection. One step, if you have an error in here, you can come in here to the connection security and add your IB address. If it's not added, go ahead and add it because I have my IB added in here. This means that it's allowing me to access the database. If I deleted my IB address, it is updating connection, it's updated. I'm just deleting it to see what's going to happen if I try to connect to the Azure database or the MySQL database on the other. So go ahead and try to connect now. As you can see, fail to connect. Client with IB address is not allowed to connect to this MySQL server. Let's go ahead and add it again. Save, don't forget to save. Should work now. Here it is, it's working. Go ahead and press OK. And we have another connection. Double click on it, and you should be able to see the cloud database that we've created through the workbench. Here it is, and it doesn't have anything. Actually, there is no tables. This is just the default tables. We can come, of course, and create tables or drop tables and work with it, but that would be it for now. So I hope you enjoyed this. It's actually interesting, at least for me. I hope you did. See you in the next picture. Okay, in this picture, we're going to see how can we create and drop databases. But first, let me define what is a database. Simply, database is an organized collection of data. It's a collection of tables, queries, functions, views, and other elements. Are we going to explain all of them and more. All of the social media and websites that we're using daily, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all of these websites and services, they're all using databases. One way or another, database or another, but they are using a database to contain information. Let's go ahead and see how can we create a database in MySQL. So I'm going to connect to my local database on my local server. Here it is, it's connected. To create a uh, database or a schema in MySQL, it's either called a schema, as you can see in here, we have three schemas created for us by default when we install the MySQL, or it can be called a database. So to create a new one, simply we can type a code in here. And don't panic, it's a very simple code. The SQL code, it's very user-friendly, as we're going to see. Or you can use the MySQL workbench. We're going to do both of them. So I can come in here simply and type create schema, and I can go ahead and type it. Maybe it's going to be human resources. It's going to be a schema or a database for the human resources. If we press in here, it's cute. As you can see here, the feedback creates schema human resources that successfully. If we go to the schema area in here and right click, just to refresh it, refresh all, and here it is, it's created. It's as simple as this. And here we can find tables. It's empty, of course, there is no tables, new views, no store procedures, all functions, but it's there. This is one of the ways. I can come in here even much, much easier and choose, if I press right click, I have this menu, create schema. And all I have to do is choose a new name. So maybe I'm going to call this test. Go ahead and click apply. 
and okay it's showing me the code here it is review the sql script to be applied on the database and as you can see it just transformed what i did using the mysql workbench into a code here it is create schema just go ahead and apply it and finish and here it is we have the database just see it's very easy both ways using uh, sql code or the wizard from the mysql workbench so how can i drop this schema or table simply i can come in here and replace the create with drop execute here it is it's helping me it's done it's removed you can go ahead and remove test run and again the are removed very easy to use i guess that's it see you in the next lecture welcome back in this lecture we're going to see how can we create users and give them certain permissions on certain schemas or databases so in here before we go ahead and connect i would like to take a look at this i'm going to choose right click and choose edit connection so before we discuss this but i would like to revise it with you quickly so the connection name i can go ahead and change it can make it any name i want the connection method leave it as it is tcp over ip the host name you can choose local host or you can change it to this ib as i showed you before which is the local ib this is the ib of here the local machine and this is the port probably you will not see this number in here you should see 3306 i have 60 i changed it just leave it as it is don't change it unless you change it intentionally okay so this is the user that will be creating users like this root users. The root is created by default when we were installing the MySQL. But we're going to create users like the root. So I need to go back and connect using the root. But I need to be an administrator to be able, or not an administrator, but have sufficient permissions to create other users. Okay. So right now I'm going to the management from here the third option which is users and privileges from here i can go and create new accounts so i can come in here simply and add an account and i can go ahead and fill the information of this account or this user so i can come in here and maybe name it world user I mean by the wallet the database or the schema wallet that we have in here i'm going to give access to this user to only this database not the secular database and not this sys database of course and not any other database if we have other databases okay go ahead and give it a password i'm gonna keep it very short and simple it's weak it's okay the account limits this is very interesting i can set the limits of this account or this user the first one is a maximum query the number of queries that the account can execute within one hour so if i said that this user can query my database 10 times only in one hour if he's going to do it for the 11th time he will not be able to do it okay so we can totally control it the maximum updates that he can use we're going to see that we can choose or make update statements to update the data in our schemas or in our database the connections i can also limit the connections to a database the concurrent connection is a simultaneous connections going to the server i can also limit this so it's very powerful and very flexible and very easy to make administrative roles administrative roles i can go ahead and give it a DBA for example as you can see here is a role that's available for me right now the DBA grants the rights to perform all the tasks so if I choose DBA it will be the same as the root and this roles in here they are going through the server not the database so if I choose it he will be a maintenance admin maintenance admin role grants rights needed to maintain the server he will be giving this access throughout the database or all the databases not only the world or takira with any other database that i have okay 
So I can go ahead and choose maybe the security admin. And the nice thing in here is that the description of each role is in front of it. Say if I would like to see what is a DB designer, it's telling me rights to create and reverse engineer any database schema, as you can see. Backup admin, from its name, it's very easy, I guess. Minimal rights needed to backup any database. So I'm gonna leave this as it is. I'm not going to play with this. I'm going to choose from the schema privileges. So what I'm going to choose here is first add entry. This is going to be really interesting. So we choose select the schema and I'm going to choose my database, which is wallet. Go ahead and click OK. And from here, as you can see, I can give it a variety of options. I can go ahead and make this user able to select. And we're going to explore all of these statements. Remember when I told you about the SQL or the SQL statements? This is some of the SQL statements. And I'm here to give permissions to this user if I want him to select, insert, or delete, or update, maybe I'll select only the select statement that he will be only able to select. If we read the description here, select privilege enables you to select rows from tables in a database. We read about the insert. Insert privilege enables you to insert or to be inserted into tables in the database. Update enables you to be updated in tables in database. I can even make it able to create. So this is talking about the data itself, the rows in the table. But this is here is talking about creating new objects, for example, or altering the objects, or creating a views, or dropping something. You see, it's very flexible. How can we do this? So all you need to do is click apply. And now the wallet user is created with the specific privileges and permissions that we gave him. Let's go ahead and close it and try to connect to my SQL using the new user. I'm going to close this. I'm going to create a new connection. I'm going to call this wallet user connection. Again, leave the TCP over IP as it is, and here is the host name that is local. And this is the default port. So you should have, or you must have this number, 3306. But I changed this port for some reasons, and I'm going to change it, but you don't need to change it. Okay? Now, I'm going to change the user. I'm not going to connect using the root. I'm going to connect using this user that I've just created. And I'm going to test the connections and going to work unless I give the password. My weak password, here it is, OK, and here it is. Successfully made my SQL connections, click OK, and here it is. We can see that we have a new connection in here. Double click on it, and we should see that we have access and we can only see the schema of the wallet in here. You see? Very interesting. If I go back and try to connect using the root or the administrator, the root is an administrator user, have sufficient permissions. Okay, probably I give it the password wrong. Yes, that's correct. Here it is. You see now, MySQL database has three different schemas, but when I connected using the wallet user, I only have access and can view one database which is the wallet database if i would like to remove this user i can simply come in here and choose it of course i can go ahead and edit any of the permissions and privileges i gave to him i can go ahead and remove create view drop let's actually test when we remove the create or alter and i'm going to leave the select I'm going to click apply I'm going to close this I'm going to connect again using the wallet user. Now I can see and open the data. If I press right click and select rows, I can view the data in here. And don't worry, we're going to discuss a lot about tables and columns and data types. Don't worry about this. This is just a demonstration. So if I wanted to create a new table, right click on the tables choose create table 
I'm gonna just leave it as it is and click apply. So create table, worded, new table. Worded is the schema of the database. Go ahead and apply. An error. If I even try to give it some columns in here, maybe this would be just leave it as it is. And I'm just adding columns in here to make sure that we've created the table successfully and see if the permissions is enough to create something or not. Now here it is, I've created one column and set it as a primary key. And again, we're going to explain this in detail. Don't worry about this. Let's see if this is going to be executed. And as we have seen when we're creating databases, MySQL Workbench is showing me the SQL code before executing it so that I can see it, I can edit it. It's really nice feature. Go ahead and click apply and still it's not going to work. There was an error while applying the SQL script to the database. You see, create command denied. You see, the create that we didn't give to the world user is denied because he doesn't have the sufficient permissions. Let's go ahead and give it the create permission. Actually, let's close all the connections and create again. And I'm going to log in again using the root to give the wallet user with permission, the enough permission and privilege so that he can create objects inside the database. So I'm going to choose the wallet, here it is. Go ahead and click on create. Apply, go back again, connect using the wallet user. Okay, I'm going to the wallet database. Right click on the tables, create table. I'm going to leave it as it is, the column also leave it as it is. Just going to click apply. Yes, and here it is. It's executed successfully. You see, now he has enough permissions to create it and it's created without any problems. And here is the new table. I know it's empty, it doesn't have any information or any useful information, but I was just demonstrating users accounts and permissions. So I hope it was fun and easy and see you in the next lecture. Okay, time for an exercise. In this exercise, we're going to create a new table called budget and we're going to apply some queries using the aggregate functions. What I need you to do in this exercise is go ahead and create a table called budget. This table is going to consist of attributes from an Excel sheet that you're going to find in the resources. They are the year, allocated budget and remaining budget and one final attribute in the remarks. After you successfully import this table into your database, go ahead and select the maximum budget of all years. This Excel sheet contains some dummy data that you're going to use. So go ahead and select the maximum budget of all years. Select the minimum budget of the last five years. Count all the valid records with actual remaining budget actual remaining budget i'm not going to explain anymore go ahead try to figure this out yourself and we're going to solve this together in a bit Pause the video try to do it okay i hope that you did it successfully if you're having a problem we're going to solve it together so the first thing that i'm going to do is to import the new table or the data so i'm going to hit right click choose table data import with it and i have here the file it's called budget.csv next we've done this plenty of times i'm going to hit create new table and i'm going to name it budget and here is all the columns i'm going to change the data type so the year i'm going to leave it as an end the allocated budget i'm going to choose it to be double and the remaining budget will choose to be double and the remarks i'm going to leave it as a text without a problem okay go ahead and hit next next show logs yes data has been imported without a problem okay the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to select from this new created table so i'm going to select all from budget and i should have some result and here it is we have the year allocated budget remaining budget and remarks and here is a couple 
of data, dummy data, of course. If I refresh my tables in here, I should find that I have a new table called budget, as you can see in here. Okay, so that's the first part of the exercise. Now, the second thing to do is to select the maximum allocated budget from here. I would like to select the maximum from this column. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So select the function we're going to use called maximum, and the column is the allo Catered budget. I'm going to rename this as maximum allocated budget from budget. Without running this now, which number is the highest? I believe it's this one. Three millions. I believe that's three million. So we should have three millions. Yes, we have three millions. That the maximum of all the numbers in this column the allocated budget the next one is to get the remaining budget with year is greater than 2015 so i'm going to do this as well i'm going to get the minimum actually excuse me the minimum remaining budget so select minimum remaining budget i'm going to rename this as minimum remaining budget from budget and we're going to add the where close in here so where the year greater than 2015 I can go ahead and make it like this or make it greater than or equal 2016 so it's up to you your choice okay I'm going to execute this query and here it is it's 1 million and if we revise the data and the budget that's totally correct that's the number that we need that's the minimum number from this to this in here okay 2015 is not included if we included it it's going to be this number i believe that's 250,000. let's run this yes but that's not the requirement okay now that's done now the last part is to select the actual the count the actual remaining budget so if we take a look at the table in here we can find that there is some records with a zero in here so we need to exclude this from this here we need to count this okay so if these are i believe 10 rows if we excluded this we should have nine so let's go ahead and try to do this so i'm going to select this time I'm going to to the count remaining budget from budget and I'm going to add a where close in here where the remaining budget not equal zero let's try to run this I have an error in here okay I have this name wrong in here I'm going to fix it yes let's run this and here it is we have nine because we excluded the zero by adding this condition the remaining budget not equal zero okay I hope that you enjoyed this exercise and that you have learned something and you are familiar with the aggregate functions and of course importing tables into your database anytime so that's it and see you in the next lecture welcome back in this lecture, we're going to discuss database tables. First, let's define what is a database table. A relational database consists of many components, as we're going to see, but the most important one is the table. Without the table, there is no need or no use for the database to exist. Database table is where all the data in the database is stored. So think of it at the heart of the database. So briefly, here is a simple example of a table here we can see there is a column first name is a column last name city and country and each of these in here are called rows so this is the first row containing james hansen from barcelona spain and etc so i can see that this is a table of four rows and four columns and of course i can keep adding data in here or rows and columns if necessary 
that's what we're going to create in the MySQL server right now. Let's go ahead and do such thing. Okay, I have the MySQL workbench opened in here. I'm going to do this post ways, the SQL code and using the workbench. So right now I'm going to do the first one, which is going to be the SQL code. So what I'm going to do right now is start typing some SQL code to create tables. It's going to be straightforward. The SQL code is not very complicated, not like programming language. So it's going to be pretty much easy, I guess. So let's go ahead and try to create our first table. So I'm going first to call it to use the human resources database. Maybe the font's too small. So if I would like to make the font or zoom in to make you see better, or you would like to see better, you can just go ahead and on your keyboard, click on control and plus button or minus. As you can see, it's making it to zoom in or zoom out using the plus and minus or the scroll, the scroll in your mouse. Okay, so this is suitable, I guess. So I'm using this database. I'm going to create create table. I'm going to call this table persons. It's going to contain some information about persons. So this is how you create table, create table and the name of the table. That's it. Not yet. We're not dead. done yet. So in here, I'm going to open a parentheses and close it and between this parentheses in here, I'm going to define the structure of my table. So I'm going to use the person ID. This is the first column. And I'm going to create the person name. So there will be an ID and the name and maybe a city and a country. Is it it? No, we need to specify the data type of each column. So what is this column going to store? Is it going to be a numbers, text, dates? So I need to tell the database the type of the information or the data that's going to be stored in each column. So it's going to be simple. I'm going to choose and I'm going to discuss data types in depth. Don't worry. And in here, enters an abbreviation for integer. So this here is going to store integer numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and etc. There is other types to store floating point numbers, 1.2, 10.5, and this numbers, and we're going to discuss this later. The person name, I can save it using a character that's a data type to store text, or I can use text, or I can use my favorite, and I'm going to tell you what the difference between the three of them later is varchar or variable character. And I need to specify the length of this field. So I'm going to choose maybe it's going to be 100, 100 letter. So the city also is going to be variable character. I'm going to change this later when you're using foreign keys and primary keys. But right now, let's leave it as variable character, maybe 50. Country also can be variable character of 100 maybe okay that's it but when you're done with the sql code in the mysql work pension here we need to add this special symbol which is the semicolon we need to add it after we finish each statement separately so as you can see now this is done and this is done and i forget one in here we need to remove it because that would be an error so if I'm going to execute this from here right now, as you can see, my tables are empty. If I refresh this, there is no tables in my database. So I'm going to execute it. Here it is. Maybe I have mistaken with the name. Yes, that's not correct. So human resources. Human resources. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Let's execute it, and yes, it's done. As you can see in here, it's successfully created. You see the green mark in here means that everything is okay. Go ahead and refresh it. And as you can see now, I have a new table. As you can see here at the columns, I have the person ID, type end, person name, variable character, city, country, also a variable character, and the length of each one. I open it. 
I can come in here and see all the information and the columns. We're not discussing data. This table is empty. There is no data inside of it, only the structure of the table. So what if I wanted to modify this table in here? For example, maybe I would like to add some column to the table. So I can come in here simply and start. And it's very straightforward also. So to add a column, I would like to add maybe the, the year of birth of this person, of each person. So all I'm going to do is tell it that I would like to alter. And as I'm typing, as you can see, MySQL Workbench is helping me, telling me if there is a keyword available for what I'm writing. As you can see now, I have the alter. Yes, I would like to use this. Alter is used to modify anything. So alter, what is you're going to alter? It's asking me. I'm going to alter a table. And this table is called persons. So that's the first part. Now let's go ahead. What are you going to do with this table? What are you going to alter? I'm going to add a column. As you can see, it's very systematic in here add column and i'm gonna give it a name maybe the name should be year of first and it's going to need a type so that's it so what i did in here is set it to alter this table persons and then add a new column called this is the name of the column and this is the type of this column go ahead and execute this I'm selecting this only because if I run this right now from here, it's going to execute all the codes in here. And I don't want it to happen. What I would like to happen is to execute only these two lines. Let's read the description in the bottom in here. Execute the selected portion of the script or everything if there is nothing is selected. So if I didn't select anything, it's going to execute everything and that's not what we want. So what I'm going to use is these two lines only go ahead and execute it if you remember we didn't have a year of purse column as you can see from here so I'm going to refresh this in here and as you can see now I have a new column called year of purse of type and it's going to contain the year of purse of each person so that's how to add a column let's go ahead and maybe try something different maybe try to drop a column i would like to delete a column i don't want maybe the city the country is enough for me so i would like to drop the city okay so let's go ahead and do this so all i'm going to do again is alter i'm altering a table called persons and what are you going to do with this table i'm going to drop a column and this column is called city don't forget the semicolon Go ahead and execute only these two lines from here. And as you can see here, if you have something wrong with your code or your script in here, it's going to tell you that something's wrong, as we have seen with the database name in here. But as you can see now, we have this green correct mark, which means that everything is all right. Let's go ahead and refresh. I'm going to refresh, and if we go to the person now, we don't see the city because it was deleted okay let's go ahead and try one more thing maybe i would like to modify the data type of some column that i have so again i'm going to choose alter table persons that's the only table that we have so we're working with it later we're going to add more tables and make relations so don't hurry now what are you going to do i'm going to modify the column Maybe I'm going to change the country, maybe increase it. So I'm going to change the country, the column country. And I'm going to make it maybe variable character 250. So right now I'm going to change. Of course, I can go ahead and change the type. I can make it int if I want, and it won't complain about this. So I'm going to change it to end first. I'm going to execute this. Let's check it again. Refresh. And as you can see now, the country is of type int. But that's not what I was going to do. That I'm just showing you that I can change it to any data type. So right now I'm going to get it back to variable character 250. 
go ahead and execute it again. Um, don't forget to refresh. And here it is. Now it's converted to variable character 250. So this is how you can create a table using a SQL script. I hope it was pretty easy for you. Let's go ahead and try the easy way using the workbench GUI. Okay, so before I go and do this using the interface of the workbench, I'm going to drop the table. So to drop a table or delete it, simply you can come in here and tell it drop table and the name of the table. Now this table is going to be deleted. So go ahead and execute this. And yes, as you can see now, drop table persons is executed without any problem. And now my tables are empty. There is no tables in the human resources database. Let's go ahead and do it using the workbench. So right click on the tables, create table. And here is the interface. It's pretty easy. First, I'm going to specify a name, maybe persons again, because we deleted it. So if you have, of course, the same name, it's not going to work, but we deleted it or dropped it. So now it's okay to name it. I can go ahead and leave command. So this table should contain information about persons. Like, and I can go ahead and specify. Okay. Now it's the columns part I need to specify in here. Just double click and you will have the column name. I'm going to give the first column version ID and I am going to leave it as an end. As you can see in here, this icon appeared in here. This means that this is a primary key. By default, the workbench assigned the first one of type N to this attribute in here with this primary key. We're going to discuss primary keys later, so don't worry. We're going to discuss also about the constraints, the not null, the unique, so don't worry. Just Remove it right now, or just leave it, doesn't matter actually. Now let's go to the next column, it's going to be called person name of type variable corrector. I can go ahead and increase it, maybe 100. And if we drop this drop down in here, I can find all the different data types allowing for me the workbench is allowing me to add. Can I choose the decimal, double, float? character even json if you're familiar with the javascript notations it's only it's also available so i'm going to add another column i'm going to call it again city i'll leave it as it is i'm going to change it actually variable character of type 100 and go to the country and that's it I can keep adding as you can see in here without any problems. After doing this in here using this really nice and easy interface, you can come in here and press apply. Apply as yes, the server is configured. Okay, it's it's creating the code for us as you can see in here. Just there is some code or script that we didn't discuss the primary key and the not now we're going to discuss next, so don't worry, but it's showing you the code that's going to apply or the script that's going to apply. Press apply, finish, and we should find the persons in here, as you can see. The same as we've, we wrote in here, the only difference that this is easier and faster. So you need to learn how to write SQL code or the script that's, that's really important. But in a real world scenario, we would like to use, professionals use this interface directly because it saves time and effort using this interface in here. And if I would like to modify any of these tables, I can, of course, go back and modify it or even drop the table if I don't want it to. If I would like to delete it, just drop it. It's now asking me, would you like to review the SQL code or drop it now? Let's go ahead and review the SQL code, drop table. This is the human resources, this is the database or the schema. Well, here is the table. Okay, execute it, and now we have no tables in our database. So that's it about tables. See you in the next lecture. Welcome back, everyone. In this lecture, we're going to discuss more about data types and see how can we fill our tables with data. So in here, I'm going to create a new table using the 
workbench i'm gonna give it the same name that we we're using persons and i'm going to start to add column so the first column is going to be the id person id this is the id for the persons it's going to be of type enter that's fine and the second column is going to be the person name you can go ahead and make it the first name that's up to you now we have the variable character and we have seen it and we have the character data type if you go down you can find that there is a character data type that's going to store also characters so what is the difference the difference between the character and the variable character is that the character is fixed lens while the variable from its name it's a variable lens field this means that the character always takes the same amount of a space regardless of what you're going to store while the variable is different depending on what you're going to store so i think that the variable character is 99 percent is suitable for your cases so i'm going to use the variable character I'm going to add maybe the country again variable character I can go ahead and change the limit of the letters to make it longer if I want I can go ahead and maybe let's add a different data type so I'm going to use the salary the salary for each person the salary I'm going to choose a data type called decimal decimal actually takes two inputs so I have to specify the length of the number, maybe eight, and I have separated by where is the comma? Here is the comma. Separated by comma, you have to add the length of the numbers after the point. So I would like to display two numbers after the point, or I can go ahead and display three. And I'm going to see this. So I'm going to choose decimal eight and two. And I'm going to choose maybe the date of purse. So I'm going to choose a data type called date that's going to store date as you can see in here and maybe we're going to check if this person is in service or not. So this column is going to be in service. I'm just asking if this person in service. This is the type of the column and this column is going to hold either one or zero. True or false. This person is in service. Yes, which is one or true. Or zero which is false so I'm going to choose a different data type which is going to be of type bit as you can see in here go ahead and choose it and you can just leave it as it is okay now I don't need this column it's created by mistake I can just right click and delete select so now my table is ready I can go ahead and apply this and here is the script that's going to be created, the person ID of type n, person name variable character, country variable character, salary of decimal as you can see 8 and 2, the date is, the date of birth is date, the in service is, go ahead and click apply and the table is created. To start filling your table with data, you can go ahead right click and select rows and from here, here is the data right now it's actually it's empty. I can go ahead and start filling this and I'm going to show you this right now but as you can see in here there is a result grid this is a different types to display your data in the table so I can go ahead and choose form editor but right now there's nothing because it's empty or I can choose field types so go ahead and choose whatever makes you happy so I'm going to add a new in here you can go ahead and choose insert a new or you can start typing in here so the person ID this is the key or this is the ID of the person we're going to discuss primary keys and IDs later don't worry so I'm going to add one you can go ahead and add whatever so maybe at 10 the person name is going to be maybe I'm using my name the country you know, I'm using any and you can go ahead and type anything that you would like. The salary, maybe I can go ahead and choose maybe $200, $250. And if you remember, we set it to accept two numbers after the point. So if I add three, it's going to accept, or four, it's going to accept. But when I'm inserting this into the table, it's going to trim it or actually round it. So the date, the date actually is accepted in this format. So I can go ahead and add the year, maybe the date of birth is 2000. This is just, of course, a dummy data. That's not a correct information. 
maybe one and one. So it takes the year, dash, months, and day. And in service, I can go ahead and add it using the true keyword in here in capital letters. Let's go ahead and click apply. Here it is. Here is the insert. We're going to discuss insert statements later, but it converts anything I do to a SQL script in here. So I'm going to click apply and finish. And here it is. We have our data. It's inserted or added to the column without problem. If I go to the form editor, I can go ahead and from this in here, navigate through my records, but I have only one record. We'll go to the field types and then you can see in here the field types of the table. So I can go ahead and add another column, but another record. But before we go ahead, did you know that this, it, as I told you, it rounded the number. I added one, two, three, four, but now I can see only 12, as you can see, because it accepts only two digits. What if we wanted to make it longer? You can come in here again to the design of the table in here. Go ahead and click on this icon. Actually, this icon, go ahead and change the salary from 8. Leave the 8, actually, or maybe make it 9, increase it a little, and this would be 3. Go ahead and apply the changes. And it's done. Now it should accept anything without a problem. Or the three digits, here it is. It added the zero by its own. So let's go ahead and try to add another record, maybe one. I'm going to choose maybe Miller. Maybe the country is Germany. The salary I can make it one thousand. And again, I'm going to use four numbers and it's going to round it. So it's going to be five, six, seven because three is not going to increase the seven. It's just pass. And the data first, I can go ahead and just add any date I would like and in service I'm going to add let's me try it with small letters if I'm going to try this with the small letters and I'm going to click on apply let's see what's going to happen it's going to pop an error in here as you can see because as I told you it doesn't accept the small letters I need to give it in capital letters let's go ahead and click apply finish and here it is Miller has been saved and it went above this record because the person ID is 1 and this is 10 so it's sorting by the person ID. I'm going to see about sorting and all of this other stuff so don't worry about this. So this is simply how you can add data to tables using different data types. So that's it and see you in the next lecture. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture we're going to discuss primary case, one of the very important concepts in databases. What is a primary case? We can define a primary key as a special relational database table column. So it's a column, or in some times we're going to see this, can be multiple columns that is uniquely identify all the table records. There is two main features about the primary key. They are unique value for each row, so they cannot be duplicated and they cannot contain null. The primary key concept is critical to an efficient relational databases. It's the main idea behind the relational databases you use primary keys to connect all the tables together as we're going to see almost all of us deal with primary keys in our daily lives without knowing that we deal with them for example all the citizens no matter what nationality you have you must have some sort of a unique number to identify you you have a passport number that's also a primary key that's unique and cannot be null car licenses bank accounts the IDs in a company, all of this are examples of primary keys. So let's go ahead and see how can we define primary keys in MySQL. So in here I'm going to open a new query. Here it is. I'm going to make it just larger. So I'm going to choose to use the human resources database. And I'm going to tell it to create a new table called employees. And I'm going to define the primary key for the employees. It can be the employee number or the employee ID, for example. So I'm going to choose employee ID. And 
it's of type end and to define this column in here as a primary key simply it's very straightforward type primary key that's it we can go ahead and continue adding the other column so i can come in here and tell it in p name for example can be variable character and can be maybe 200 i can come in here and say maybe country and maybe also variable character 200 okay let's go ahead and run this if we run this right now we should see that we have a new table with a primary key defined already in here as you can see here is this underline in here as you can see this abbreviation pk which means primary key okay there's other ways to create the primary keys let's go ahead and drop the table i'm going to use the keyword drop table and please let's go ahead and execute this now the table is dropped i'm going to use a different way to create primary keys inside of a table but first let me show you this trick in here i can come in here and leave this code as it is but i can comment it so i can come in here and type this in here and as you can see it turned gray this means that it's not going to execute this in here so anything that takes this two dashes in here is not going to be executed so this is called comments so you can comment your code to keep it in front of you if you'd like to keep it but it's not going to be executed okay this can be helpful also when you're leaving comments for yourself so i can come in here and leave comment maybe creating this table for this specific purpose you see for your colleagues for yourself when you go in time and come back to work with the table so you can just leave comments for yourself okay let's go ahead and see the other way this was off topic but it's good to know that you have this option so let's go ahead and again create small capital it doesn't matter actually create table please and i'm going to add the complete id again and and I'm not going to type anything here. I'm just typing the name of the column and the type. And here I'm going to choose employee name, variable character, maybe 200. And don't forget the comma, country, variable character, 200 also. And that's not it. Now we are done with creating the columns, but there is something missing, the primary key. Primary key is some sort of constraints i'm going to discuss constraint next so i can come in here and tell the mysql that i would like to add the constraint as you can see in here it's a keyword i'm gonna call it for example pk maybe m by d and i'm gonna tell it that it's going to be a constraint of type primary key and it needs to say or to give it the column itself, right now I don't have a column, I have a constraint, I have a name for the constraint, I have a type for the constraint, which is the primary key, because I can define other constraints. Right now it needs a name, and the name of the column is the employee ID. And that's it. Let's go ahead and try to execute this, or you can run because the other columns, the other code actually, the SQL script in here is commented. Let's go ahead and execute this. And here it is it should be created without a problem here it is and the columns as you can see here it is so the id is primary key as you can see hope it's easy for you it's very straightforward there is of course the other way the easy way using the mysql workbench when we created the tables i can come in here of course and do this as you can see in here it's already creating the primary key when you're adding your columns in here it's assuming that the first column should be the primary key as you can see i can check it from here or from here there is other constraints that we can add like the not null the unique there's many others and we're going to discuss this in the next lecture welcome back in this lecture we're going to discuss constraints constraints are used to limit the data entered to my table to make it behave in some way so sometimes i can make it auto increment 
specific columns. Sometimes I would like to accept only specific data into my columns user constraints and we have seen previously how to use primary key and primary key is some sort of constraints so we're going to discuss more about constraints in this lecture so in here i'm going to create a new table called persons and i'm going to specify some constraints in this table so i'm going to create table i've seen this many times persons and I'm going to give it some columns. So the first column should be person ID of type n. This is primary key. This is my primary key. And we have seen this before, but let me add some new constraints here. So I would like this column in here, the primary key, the end or this number to be auto incremented. I would like this to increment without me doing anything. So how can I do such thing? It's very easy. All you have to specify is tell it that this is going to be an auto increment column. That's it. Let's go to the next column, person name. And the person name is going to be of type variable character to 100, maybe 50. And what I would like to do with this person name is that it's mandatory. It has to be filled. It has to be filled. You see in some websites that you have to specify some attributes or fields and some other are not so this field is going to be required and to make this happen to make the database force me to enter the person name i have to specify this keyword not null very easy so now it's checking that this person name is not null each time i'm saving a new record into my database let's go ahead and maybe type the address and the address there is nothing specific about the address, maybe 300, and that's it. It's not going to be not null or a primary key or auto increment or anything. The user have the option to add it or don't add it, okay? So it's optional. I'm going to add a new column in here, maybe the passport number, and the passport number is going to be of type variable characters because it contains some letters. A, maybe C, B, and let me give you a tip in here if you're going to create any number that you don't create or perform calculation on it in the future on your application on your queries don't use numbers what does this mean so if i have a telephone number or a mobile number or any other fields that is going to store a number but i'm not going to perform any calculations on this number make it as a variable character a character or a text because you're not going to use the arithmetic operations on it so it's better to use the string operations with this field okay so i'm going to add the passport number for me it's 20 and i'm going to add an attribute in here if you think about it the passport number is a unique number it should not be duplicated no other person should have the same number as your passport number it's only one so i have to tell it that this is going to be a unique as you can see in here it's going to be a unique column so no one can have your passport number okay so i can come in here and add the country variable character it's going to be maybe 100 and there is nothing special about the country maybe the salary and there is something special about the salary course it's going to be of type decimal the length is two if you remember decimal takes two inputs in here this is the length and this is the length of the point or the numbers of the point so i'm going to specify that if the user didn't enter a salary for the person there is going to be a default value and this default value is going to be maybe two thousand two thousand anything dollars yours any currency but we use the keyword default okay default and the number so i'm going to run this here it is should be created without any problem and if i refresh i should have the person's table in here as you can see so let's go ahead and test our condition so i'm going to select rows and i'm going to add some in here so i'm going to specify the person id as one and i'm going to choose maybe Veronica, like the name and the address, go ahead and type anything, maybe 
233 street west bank anything and the passport number i'm going to add maybe a 123c and the country i can go ahead and choose new example uk and i'm not going to add any salary to see if the condition in here the default 2000 is going to be applied or not so i'm going to click apply in here and here is the sql script apply and here it is it added the 2000 without me doing anything let's go ahead and test two things i'm going to test the auto increment in here i'm not going to specify any numbers in here it's going to auto increment by itself and i'm going to leave the person name empty and if you remember we have a not null constraint or condition that's checking that the person name is not null and i'm going to specify the address directly 100 street any neighborhood for example and the password i'm going also to choose the password to be the same to see if it's checking it correctly this condition and the country is going to be uk again and the country is going to be accepted without problem because i didn't specify the country column to be unique for example and go ahead and specify the salary maybe 4000 and i'm going to click apply let's go ahead and check so in here there is two problems the first one is that if you read in here as you can see there is no default value for the persons if you take a look in here so let's go ahead and give it a value so i'm gonna give veronica a value I'm gonna give not Veronica actually Veronica is the first record I'm going to add value which is a person name for the second record maybe James go ahead and click apply yes and we still have a problem because the passport number is duplicated as you can see in here duplicated entry okay because we give the same passport number for two persons which is working very fine now I'm going to change maybe the C make it here for example and let's go ahead and click apply and remember that we didn't specify the person id and here it is as you can see it's executed successfully and here it is it added three it's auto incremented and the salary is 400 without a problem because specified it and it accepted the name and the passport number and the country there is no problem with it so it accepted it and it's duplicated without any problem so that's it about constraints See you in the next lecture. Okay, time for a small exercise. In this exercise, we're going to practice what we have learned in this chapter. I need you to go ahead and create two tables. First one is in please. We're going to create it in a different way. We've created it before, but we're going to recreate it using different techniques. And we're going to create another table called jobs. So what is the structure or the columns of each table? So the in please table should contain employee id which is the primary key of this table you have seen how to create this first and last name which cannot be empty gender which can be male or female and also cannot be empty country date of birth, mobile number email address and remarks and there is no special constraints or conditions about these fields so this is for the first table what about the jobs jobs is going to contain job id which cannot be duplicated and cannot be empty which means that it's going to be a primary key that's not the definition for primary keys job title cannot be empty so this is the column that's going to hold the title of each job the minimum salary and it falls is going to be 3000 3000 any currency okay job maximum salary and this is the maximum salary for each job and it's going to be maybe 10,000. The last field is going to be different. It's going to be is managerial or not. So this means that this field is going to be like a flag, yes or no, a true or false, which is determining that each job is a managerial job or not. So that's what I'd like you to go ahead and do. Let's go ahead and try to do it. I'm gonna pause the video here until you go ahead and finish it and when you're done, let's go back and try to do it together. Okay, go ahead and do it.
Okay, I hope it's easy. Let's go ahead and try to do it together. So the first thing that we're going to use or do is use the, let me zoom in. Okay, that's good, I hope. So I'm going to use the human resources database, semicolon, terminate the statement. And in case that you have already a table called in, please, I'm going to drop it. So drop table in, please, just in case that we have it already. The semicolon also to terminate this statement. And let's go ahead and start creating our first table, which is in please containing the fields that we mentioned. So I'm going to use create table in please. Open the parentheses and close them. And here I'm going to use empty ID. It's going to be an end and it's going to be the primary key of the table. And then we have the first name. It's going to be a text, so it should be variable character. Maybe it's 100. And this should not be null. No, this must contain a data. Then we have the last name. It's going to be variable character also. Again, 100. 100. Again, not null. I must give it a number. Give it a value, actually. Then the gender, the gender we can make it bit, which contains true or false, one or zero, but I prefer to make it variable character to contain the whole text, male, female, or maybe I can, some site, some websites actually let you not to choose. So sometimes you'll see that I prefer not to choose. So I can add other options other than male or female in case that I need it. So it's better to make it variable character. I'm going to make it variable character, maybe 15 for now, and it's going to be not null, it must be given. Okay, then we have the country, variable character, maybe 150, maybe 200, 200 is good. There is nothing special about the country. I'm going to go to the next one, which is the date of birth going to be a date also it's nothing special about this the mobile number as i told you before if you are not going to perform some calculation on a number it's better that you do it add text so i'm going to choose variable character also one benefit of this is that we can add dashes or parentheses to the mobile number itself sometimes in some countries we add dashes or parentheses maybe 100 100 is too long maybe 25, 25 is good. Okay. Now let's do the email address. Variable character, maybe 50. And the final one remarks. This should contain any other information other than the previous column. So maybe we missed some information. Maybe we would like to add some remarks about this in please. So you can go ahead and add it in this column. And I would like to make it a little bit longer so maybe it's 500 okay. we are done with the please column don't forget the semicolon let's go ahead and create the other table create table jobs not job jobs let's go ahead and create the first one it's a job id it's going to be an end it's going to be also primary key which is like going to be duplicated and is going to be a unique value again job title the title of each job or the job name variable character and it's going to be maybe the job title 200 and going to be not null must be given and the job minimum salary it's going to be decimal because i can add the numbers after the point i'm gonna make it maybe nine and two okay and in this in here if you remember from the uh, slides that we need to add a default value if you remember also from the previous lectures to add a default value all you have to do is specify the default keyword maybe three thousand yes that's a good job maximum salary this is the next field also decimal nine and two and the default is maybe 10,000. You can go ahead and choose your own 
preferences if you would like. Okay, let's go ahead and choose the last column, which is managerial and it's going to be bit. I'm using the is with the bit also because this is a better practice. Because this is going to be a question and this is the answer. Is this job a managerial? Yes or no? One or zero. So it's better to leave it as this is managerial. And also when you're reading the tables or the data, you know that this is of type bit without you going to the structure of the table itself. So it's a good naming convention to leave it as it is. But you can go ahead and make any other name if you want. Okay. And the default value of this is going to be false. And that's it. We are done. Let's go ahead and execute all of this in here. Let's go ahead and execute it. Of course, I can just leave it and execute it. And here it is. All of this drop successfully, created the increase table successfully, and the jobs table successfully. Let's go ahead and refresh it. As you can see, here are the jobs. Let's go ahead and open it. And here it is, the job, and here is the primary key, and the job title, which is not null, and the minimum salary, which contained the default of 3,000, and the maximum salary, which contains 10,000, 10,100. Go ahead and edit it in here. It's not a problem. Go ahead and apply. Yes, apply this. Okay, it's edited already. <laughs> and if we check the empties in here, here it is. Here all the fields, the first name, it's not null, as you can see from here, the last name, the gender, and etc. So that's it for this exercise. I hope it was fun and easy, and see you in the next lecture. Welcome back, everyone. In this lecture, we're going to discuss foreign keys. What is a foreign key? We can define a foreign key as one or more columns in a table that refers to the primary key in another table to do one job is to link these two tables. So we can say that foreign keys actually are used to link two or more tables together. And we're going to use them as our database of human resources is growing. And what we're going to do in this lecture is going to create new two tables. The first one is countries and the second one is cities. We're going to create them using the SQL script and we will see how to create foreign keys using SQL script. Then we're going to create another new table called departments using the MySQL workbench and we're going to link all of these tables together. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So first let's go ahead and create our table. So I'm going to create, first let me use the human resources, resources database and I'm going to create a new table countries why I'm creating this table if we take a look to the employees table in here I have the country column in here the country is actually variable character it would be better if I have a separate table for the countries so that I can change them I can add the capital I can add the names in English or in any other languages and I can link this column in here that I'm going to create, the primary key of the countries that I'm going to create in a bit, to the employees table. As we're going to see, we're going to see this, so don't worry if you don't get it. So, in here I'm going to create the country ID, and I'm going to maybe make the C capital in here and I'm going to I'm going to create this as a primary key but I'm going to create it in a different way so just leave it as it is just an end and I'm going to use the colon called country name variable character maybe 150 and it's going to be not null we've seen all of this before I'm going to use another field or column called Abbreviation, this is the abbreviation for the country, you see the abbreviation like the US, DE, UK, so I can go ahead and add it, this is an extra information that I can add it in here rather than adding it in the employees table which will make no sense, see, so variable character, I can go ahead and make it maybe 3, and this can be null, I cannot add it, or I can add it, it's okay, and I'm gonna choose the capital 
Uh, the first column is going to be variable character, maybe 100. And that's it for this table. But I didn't specify the primary key. I'm going to do this using a different technique. So I am going to say that I'm going to use a primary key and I'm going to tell it that the column is country ID, as simple as this. So this is a different way to create primary keys, as you can see. So let's go ahead and run this. Country's ID already exists. Okay, I have it already in here, so I'm going to drop it. I'm going to drop it, drop it. Okay, let's go ahead and create it. And here it is, it's created. The new one is created successfully. Sometimes this happens if you already have it. So, okay, let's go ahead now. Right now, I didn't do any foreign key work. So, in the next table that I'm going to create, which is the cities, I'm going to create my first foreign key. Okay, I'm going to create right now the second table, which is the cities, and I'm going to add the foreign key in this table. So, I'm going to create table cities, and I'm going to add the first column is going to be city ID, it's if type end, and the city name, variable character, that's another column, maybe 150, not, no, and in here, I'm going to tell it that there will be another column. For the country ID of type end, and this column here is going to link to this table, and we're going to see how can we do this. So, if there is ten cities, for example, inside of USA or UK in any other country, I can go ahead and give it the same ID number of the USA or the UK or any other number to perform the link, and I can go ahead and extract all the information from this table of this country. When we're going to fill, and we're going to do this in the upcoming lectures, we're going to fill data in our table, you're going to see this better. So don't worry. And in here, I need to specify first the primary key, which is going to be, primary key is going to be the city ID. And to add the foreign key, and here is the new part, I'm going to add foreign key, and I'm going to tell it, what is the column that's going to be the foreign key or act as the foreign key? It's going to be the country ID, this one in here. And I'm going to tell it it's going to be references. This is a keyword in the SQL. And I'm going to tell it going to be references to the countries table. As you can see, it's table in here, this table. And I need also to specify the column. So the column is going to be ID. So what is done in here? So let's revise it. Again, so I'm telling it that I'm going to add a new column for a constraint, add a foreign key, and this foreign key is going to be the country ID, which is this field in here. And this field is going to relate or reference to this table countries in here to this column country ID in here from this table. Okay, let's go ahead. I hope it's easy. Let's go ahead and try to run this. Okay, it's created. Let's go ahead and refresh our database. And here it is. It's created successfully, as you can see. And here, as you can see, that there is a bold, which means that this is a key or a foreign key. If we open the foreign keys in here, we can see that there is a one created. The target is country, so the country ID is going to the country ID. And if we open the table itself in here, I can see that the country ID in here is a different color. If I go to this tab from in here and the bottom, foreign keys, I can see that there is a name for the foreign key. It's auto-generated and the reference table is human resources, a database and the countries. If I press on this reference table, I can see that it's linked to the country ID as we specified in the SQL script in here. So, I hope that's easy. Let's go ahead and create another table called departments, which is going to contain the departments for the company or the human resources database that I'm creating. So, let's go ahead and create it. So, I'm going to create it using the workbench. So, create table. I'm going to use add the name, department, ID. It's going to be an end and primary key of course 
Um, I'm using Postway so that you get familiar with how it's done using the SQL script and the workbench. So I'm going to add the column, the part, and name. It's going to be variable character. I can maybe make it 100. That's it. And I would like to make it not null, but this one, this one. I believe this one in here. I think it's like that. Yes. Go ahead and apply this. And don't forget to give it a name, of course. Departments. And it's going to be created. And it's created. Here it is. The departments. Very good. Now, we need to do one last thing. We need to go to the employees table, the one that we've created in the exercise before. Here it is, and we need to modify the country to link it to the new table that we've created. Right now, it's already a variable character. There is no relation, no foreign keys, no nothing. So I need to go ahead and do this and make the employee also. Actually, it's primary key. I don't need to modify this. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So here I have the employees table opened. I'm going to change the country ID. I'm going to make it the country to your country ID and I'm going to make the variable right now if I try to perform the relations between the country ID in here and the country ID in the countries table it's not going to work because they are different data type this one in here is of type enter and this here of type variable character so I need to change this and make it an end and if we apply this, okay, now it's of type end. If I go to the employees, let's refresh our databases. As you can see right now, our database is growing and we're going to get more information and more detail as we're going. So if we go to the country ID here it is now it's an end the match the time I can go ahead and add it but before we go ahead and add it I need also to create the department ID and I'm going to link this also to the department ID table that I've just created okay I know that's a lot of work but I hope that you're getting it it's all about relations this is relational databases so let's go ahead and make it also a Enter and save it. So I'll apply this. Apply. And that's it. Now we need to go to this tab in here, foreign keys, and we start adding the relation. So the first one we're going to do is the country ID. So I can come in here and give it a name, country ID, maybe foreign key one. It's just a random name, just maybe an abbreviation for the relation. And we're going to link it to the human resources countries. And we're going to the country ID. And we're going to references. As you can see in here, see the references column is going to be the country ID in this table. This drop down list in here is from this table. So if I change it, it's going to be changed. If I change it to any other country, but it will not be unlogical it would be unlogical if i have it to cities for example because i'm going to link the country so the country id in my column and please is going to be linked to the country id in the countries table okay let's go ahead and click apply yes yes it's working let's go ahead and add the department id let's add another one it's going to be department id Foreign key, maybe one. I'm going to choose. It's going to be the departments, the reference table. I'm going to go to the department column in my table in here, and I'm going to choose the department ID. And if you check the code, it's going to do the same. Add constraint, foreign key, the references, the same that we were doing. Okay. Let's go ahead and close all of this. I'm going to refresh my database or tables. And if I open the employees right now to check that everything is working, as you can see here, the poll, which means that this is a foreign key, the country ID, and the department ID. And if I go to the relations, 
all the foreign keys I can see that the departments is going to be linked to the department ID and the countries is linked to the country's country ID so I hope that was easy and fun I know it maybe for the first time it's going to be a little bit complicated but you're going to get used to it as we're going we're going to add more tables and more relation and I hope it's getting easier with time so that's it and see you in the next lecture welcome back in this lecture we're going to discuss something really important and very powerful it's called entity relationship diagram or commonly known as ERD why would I need this ERD if you think of it as our database is growing for example our small database the human resources you cannot keep track of the relationship between the tables which columns which primary keys foreign keys what is connecting to what so it's going to be a hustle when you have a lot of tables so in this situation ERD comes in handy so let's define the ERD what is the entity relationship diagram it's a visual form of the relational databases it shows entities or the tables in a database and the relationships between tables within this database it's essential to have an entity relationship diagram it shows three basic elements the tables the attributes or the columns and the relationships between them so let's go ahead and see how can we generate this ERD diagram in workbench so in here I'm going to connect to the default one I'm going to give it the password okay here is our human resources database I'm going to choose from here from database actually reverse engineer I then click on it it's going to ask you for the credentials username and password okay I then give it again press next and here I'm going to select database I'm going to choose our database the human resources click next next and here it is import mysql tables object okay go ahead and import all of them and in a second we have this form or this diagram you see this is our tables this is the erd diagram you see it's very beautiful it shows the tables as we agreed and the columns with the types and the relationship between each table you see it's very powerful so i can go ahead and organize it a little bit this table we don't need it really the persons because we were just testing it when we were creating our first database the human resources but we don't need it right now actually so i'm going to work with the other so in here i have the employees table as you can see in here i'm gonna take it up here so i have the employee id of type and and I have the first name, variable character, the last name, variable character, the gender, country, and you can see that if there is a relation between anything, it's going to show up in here. So, for example, if there is a relation between the employees that we already made and the country, it's going to tell me that there is a relation. And when I hover over this line in here, it's going to tell me that it's the country ID in here and the country ID in here, as you can see really really easy to see now the relationship that's going to the database and we have also another relation between the countries and the cities if you remember so we have here the country ID and the country ID in the cities so now I can see the relation chips between this tables in a visual form and if you think of it here is we created a job Tables, but it doesn't have any relation right now so now I can figure out that there is no relation between the jobs and any other table so that maybe I forgot to make a relation maybe that I need to make it later so it's very powerful even the status the newly created table it has a relation with if you hover over in here from the status ID to the status ID in here and the departments so it's a very powerful way to visually see the relation between the tables as you're building more tables in the future so that would be it and see you in the next lecture welcome back everyone in this lecture we're going to discuss one of the most important statement which is the select statement probably it's the most famous and the most important statement which will allow you to retrieve data from your database or from the tables let's go ahead and take a look at it 
So here is a very basic select statement. As you can see, I'm selecting data from the employees table. Let's take a look and see how it is constructed. As you can see, here is a select keyword and here is the sign, it's called asterisk and you can find it on your keyboard on number eight. Okay, and we have from and the table name. So here I'm specifying what I'm selecting. This mean here, this asterisk mean here that I'm selecting all the columns, not the employee ID or the first name only, no, all the columns without specifying names. And in a bit, we're going to select specific columns. And this from here is going to tell the database engine from which table I'm going to retrieve the data. And here is the table name. I can go ahead and change this, make it cities, for example, and they can run this, as you can see in here. I can go back to employees and run this again. As you can see, here is all the data. So let's take a look how to select specific columns. Maybe I would like to select the employee ID, first name and last name only. So I'm going to type select and I'm not going to use this sign here, the asterisk. No, I'm going to select employee ID. That's the first column that I'm going to select. First name and last name. And as you can see, they are separated by commas. Okay. Now we have the from employees to tell the database that I would like to select from this table. Let's go ahead and try to run this and let's take a look. Here it is. We have the employee ID, first name and last name only. And I can go ahead and keep adding. I can come in here and tell it, for example, maybe the date of birth. Okay, and I'm going to run this and right now the data bear is going to be displayed in here. Let's run this and as you can see here it is. So it's very flexible actually and very uh, straightforward. Let's go ahead and try something different. If I have a lot of data in my table like a thousands of records, that's going to be a lot and probably I'm not going to do this. I'm going to select only a portion of the data. If I use a select statement like this and they have a thousand of records as i told you it's going to be a headache for my database engine so it's preferable that we only select a portion without any filtration later we're going to discuss the where clause and how to select based on a specific condition but if i'm selecting generic data i like to limit it to a specific number so let's try this I'm going to again select all from employees and I'm going to type this here limit five this here means that I'm going to get all the records from the employees table this asterisk means all and here the table and I'm going to limit the result of this query to only five records let's go ahead and run this this is what I mean it's only five rows or five records that I can see now. If I increase this to seven, maybe it's going to be seven. As you can see, if I even choose one, it's going to be one, as you can see in here. So it's very powerful. When you have thousands of records, it's going to really matter. Okay, we'll make a difference. And you can also use it with this. So if I take this as a copy, I'm going to type it in here and I can come in here and tell it limit three. This means that I'm going to select only three. If I run this, as you can see here it is. Only three of these selected columns. And if I remove one of them and run again, it's going to work without a problem. Okay, as you can see, it's very powerful. So that's the very basics of the select statement. We're just scratching the surface of the select statement. On the upcoming lectures, we're going to discuss more and more about the select statement because there is a lot to discuss about the select statements, but we're going to take it one by one. See you in the next lecture. Okay, how about a small exercise? I know that we didn't learn a lot about the select statement yet, but let's go ahead and test this small knowledge. So I need you to go ahead and select some data from Sakila database. I need to go ahead and select the title, 
the description, the release year, rating, links from table called Film and Sequila database. Go ahead, pause the video, try to do this exercise. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope that you did it without a problem. Let's go ahead and do it together. So I'm going to tell it that I'm going to use the Sequila database. This is the separate statement, that's why I'm adding the semicolon in here. And I'm going to select the title, the description, the release year, the rating, lens from film table. Let's go ahead and test this. Yes, here it is. Here is the data from this table. And as you can see right now, they are limited to 10. I can go ahead and change the limit from here. I'm going to choose don't limit. So I'm going to run this. As you can see now, here is all the data in this table. If you'd like to take a look at the structure of the table, you can go ahead to the Sequila database, tables, go all the way down to film database film table actually here it is and here is the different columns if you'd like to take a look at this columns okay i hope it was easy let's go ahead and see something different see you in the next lecture the where close where close is used a lot of times with a select statement where is used to filter records or rows based on specific conditions let's take a look at this table this table here this is some of the signs that we can use with the where. And use this sign, which is the equal. We can say some condition is equal to one for a specific name or a specific country or a specific gender, as we're going to see, or even not equal. This sign here means that it's not equal to a specific value. Also, we have the greater than, less than, greater than or equal, less than or equal. We have also the between, which is going to select between a range of values or like, like it's very powerful and I'm going to see how to use it later and also searches in a list of values. This is some of the signs or keywords that we can use with where with the select statement. Let's go ahead and see how to use this in MySQL. So I'm going to normally select the records from the employees table. I'm going to run this query and here it is. Here is all the records without a problem. I can go ahead and select, for example, the females only or the males. So how can I do this? I'm going to add in here where, as you can see, it turns blue, it's a keyword. And we need to specify the column, which is the gender. This is the column that I'm going to filter my query based on. And I'm going to tell it that I'd like to select the females. We need to add a single quote in here because this is a string. If I remove the single quotes from here the mysql database will think that this is a column or a keyword and it's not going to work as you can see now i have an error unknown column female in the where clause okay so we need to tell it that this is a data in the table it's not a column it's not a value let's go ahead and run this and here it is now we have only the females as you can see I can go ahead and change this to be male. So I'm going to get the males only, as you can see in here. Very straightforward. We can also use this. I'm going to copy this here. And I'm going to select the females, but I'm not going to use the equal. I'm going to use, if you remember, this sign here means not equal. So I'm going to use this. This means that I'm going to use all the columns from the employees table. And I'm going to set the gender not to equal male. So it's the opposite of male, which is the female, obviously. So I'm going to run this. And here it is. We have the female. If I added a female in here, this means that I'm going to get the opposite or not equal to female. So I'm going to get all the males. Okay. I hope that you get it. We can also use it with other I'm going to take this as a copy with other columns. So I'm going to, for example, select the country ID. I'm going to get all the employees from the country number one. Now we are not 
filtering based on the gender we are filtering based on the country id we have john here wilfred noah are from country number one no matter what the gender is we're going to filter based on the country here it is so we have and i forget jessica okay sorry for this jessica so we have four employees from country number one i can go ahead and change it to be number two as you can see we have the employees from number two and they can go ahead also and use the not equal going to use it so now i have all the employees that's not equal to two so i have one and six three four five but i don't have two i can go ahead and filter one or remove one from the query as you can see i have two three four five six without the one or the country number one in please okay i hope that you get this so i can even combine different queries like this i can go ahead and tell it that i would like to select the employees from the country number one and the gender equal male so i'm going to get all the males from country number one if you remember there were four employees one female and three males let's run it i'm running it without this other condition only the country number one so i'm going to get all the employees from country number one we have four records john wilfred noah and jessica one female and three males if i added the male condition to this so now jessica is going to be filtered out let's run this and we have only three as you can see if i reverse this to be female it's going to work the same and i'm going to get only the female which is jessica in the country id number one i can go ahead also and use the date to use the date actually it's very interesting i can come in here and tell it select all from employees where country id equal one let's add a semicolon in here i'm going to get all the employees from number one and i would like to filter based on the date of birth or the date would be maybe the employees from months march okay so how can i do this i'm going to add this condition and if i added dob equal three this doesn't make any sense if i run this right now it's not going to get me anything actually there is no a date of birth equals three there is a month equals three so in here and we're going to discuss this later in detail but just to give you uh, a sneak peek for the function that's used with the date this is a date if you remember the date of birth is of type date we can use this here tell it i'd like to get the months of this this is one of the functions that the mysql database engine is giving us that i can get the months out of this here or the year or the day or any part of the date using this basic keywords in here months so i'm going to filter now the country id number one and the months of the date of birth equals three let's take a look at this should have one employee which is john in here which is the date of birth of john is three if i change it just to be five and run it again now we have wilfred which is the date of birth of wilfred is five if i choose something that doesn't exist in country number one i'm going to get no results i run this right now as you can see there is no result i can go ahead and change this to be a day or a year let's go ahead and try it but let me first check the data so we have 1982 so i'm going to select the the please be on the year which is 1982 i'm going to change this month in here to be year and i'm going to add this number 1982 and i'm going to run this if i run this right now we have john here it is i can go ahead of course and remove this condition and filter based on the year only of the data burst without this condition in here to make it more results to get me more results 
So I'm going to remove this in here and I'm going to select on the year. Let's check if there is other employees born on the same year. Yes, there is another one. It's Emily. As you can see in here, it's country number six and it's also 1998. I can go ahead also and get the greater than or equal 1982. If I run this now, it's going to give me all the employees from starting from 1982 and till we reach this year. Okay. And here it is. We have 1990, 1986, 1982, and 1982 two times. Okay. So that's again also very basics of the where clause. We're going to see more examples and more scenarios as we're going through the course. This is just a introduction to the where clause. I hope that you get it. And that's it. See you in the next lecture. Okay. How about small exercise about the where clause? I need you to go ahead and select again data from Sakila. I need you to go ahead and select all the columns from the film table and select all the movies or all the films greater than or equal 90 minutes. Both the video, go ahead, try to do this exercise. Okay, I hope that you did it without a problem. Let's go ahead and try to do this together. So I'm going to use Sakila. I'm going to type select asterisk or all the columns from Sakila film that is the database and here is the table and I'm going to add the where clause so where lens greater than or equal 90 let's go ahead and run this query and here it is I know it's a little bit small font but as you can see here is the lens now we have all the movies with a lens over or equal, of course, 90 minutes, as you can see. Okay, that was the exercise. Let's go ahead and continue discussing more about the select statement. See you in the next lecture. We have seen how to use the select statement. We have seen how to use the where. Another keyword that's used usually with the select and the where is called order by. So what is exactly is order by? Order by is used to sort the data retrieved from the database in ascending or descending order by default it is in ascending order let's go ahead and see how to use this order by keyword so i'm going to select from the employees table if you take a look at the data in here they are not sorted based on a specific order if you're saying this you're mistaken it's not being sorted if i would like to sort it by the country or the date of birth, or alphabetically by the first name, or any other column, if I have different table, I can go ahead simply and use this very powerful keyword, order by, but don't forget to remove the semicolon from here, add it at the end of the statement. Order by, but it's still not yet complete. We need to add a column so that the MySQL database engine can know which column that I would like to sort it with. So I'm going to choose first name I would like to sort it by the name as you can see right now it's not being sorted by the name and I'm going to hit execute so as you can see the first name here the order has changed based on the first name if I change it to something different maybe like the gender as you can see they are now in a mess they are not in a specific order because we are based or we are ordering based on the first name I'm going to execute this and here it is the first the females are the first and then the males. I can go ahead and reverse it using this keyword descending. And as I told you in the presentation, that by default it's ordering it in an ascending way. So right now I'm reversing this operation and then doing it descending way. Refresh and here it is. Now we have the male and the female. They are of course sorting it alphabetically. And this is descending, so the M should come after the F. Okay, you can go ahead and choose the country ID. So you remove all of this country ID. Again, it's going to sort from one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. And if I add the descending, it's going to reverse the operation. Okay, I can go ahead and add another column to sorted with so i can go ahead and sort it by the 
country ID and the name, the first name, for example. Let's go ahead and do this. To do this, all you have to do is just add a comma, first name. Let's refresh, and here it is. We have the country ID. This is the sort column number one, and then we have the first name. So we have the country ID, then the first name, as you can see. That's one of the ways I can go ahead and reverse this to make it, for example, country ID in a descending way, then the first name. So now we have number six, we have Emily and John. Then number five, we have Ali and Maya. I can go ahead also and add a descending in here. So right now everything would be ordered in a descending way. The country, as you can see, now we have John, Emily, Maya and Ali, the opposite of the last query or the last result. I can go ahead and add a third column if I want, maybe the date of birth. But right now it's not going to be much of a difference because there are not a lot of data in here. Okay, so that's how to use the order by. Order by the column that you would like and if you'd like to add a descending because by default it's an ascending order. So it's very easy to use and they are used a lot. The select, where and the order by. So that's it and see you in the next lecture. Okay, how about a small exercise about the order by? What I need you to do in this exercise is to select all the columns from the film in Scala database, sort by the length in a descending way and then by the title. Go ahead, pause the video, try to finish this exercise. Okay, I hope it's easy. Let's go ahead and try to do it together. So I'm going to use Scala and I'm going to select all from film and I'm going to order by lens descending to order it in a descending way and then the title. Okay, let's run this. Should it run it all? Yes, here it is. Now we have all the data from the film table, as you can see in here, and they are ordered by the lens, as you can see in here, in a descending way. This is the longest period, as you can see, 185, 184, and it's counting down because this descending keyword in here. And then we have the title. If we go all the way up to 185, we can see that the title is being sorted, as you can see here, the A, then the... I think the title is in here at Chicago North, Control, Anaheim, and etc. As you can see, you can go ahead and reverse it to see if it's working. I'm going to add a descending in the title. And now it has changed it, okay? As you can see, still we have the 185, 185, and we still have the title, but it is reversed right now, okay? Hope that you get this, and it was easy. I'm trying with this small exercise to emphasize on this very important statements so i hope that you get it and that's it see you in the next lecture welcome back everyone to a new lecture in this lecture we're going to discuss one of the most amazing and powerful features of mysql which is the like and wild cards like actually determines whether a specific character string matches a specified pattern so you are searching with like for patterns not actual text as we're going to see a pattern can include a regular characters or wild card characters, which is a very powerful feature in here. A wild character is used to substitute any other characters in a string. We have two different options in here. The underscore allows you to match on a single character. So if you don't remember what is this character is, or if you'd like to get all the characters, you can use for one character single character you can use this underscore as we're going to see in a bit or you can simply use the percentage allows you to match any string of any lens including the zero lens which is very magical as we're going to see let's go ahead and see how this works so in here i'm going to select all from the these table as we have seen many times before Let's display the data first, as you can see in here. So I can go ahead, for example, and search for John, but maybe I would like to display all of the Johns or any other name 
that may contain the first letters J and O, for example. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I can come in here and say where first name like, and then I will say John, and I'm not going to complete it. I'm going to hit underscore two times. So what I just did in here is that I told the MySQL is the first name like, as you can see in here, it's going to be something like J and O and two more characters that I don't remember. Let's go ahead and refresh this. Now I get John, as you can see. If I remove the one from here, now I'm telling the MySQL database that it's only one letter missing and that's wrong. It's not actually wrong, but it's not existing in my database. If I run this right now, nothing is going to be displayed because I don't have John with Zaud the H, for example. That's actually not very magical. What is really magical about this is that I can use the percentage sign, which is very powerful. So I am telling my secret right now is that I remember that there is a J and an O and I don't remember the letters. Maybe it's one, two, three, maybe it's zero. So if I run this right now, I'm going to get John, as you can see. And if I remove even the O and run again, now I have even Jessica because Jessica also starts with J. That's pretty interesting, I believe. So if I change this to an S, so I'm going to get all the employees with S, where the first name starts with S to be specific. If I run this right now, as you can see, I have Sergey and Sophia. Pretty interesting. But what if I wanted to enhance this even more and get all the employees that contains an S? So I can do something like this. Add the percentage sign here or the wild card in here. So I am telling MySQL that no matter what the letters before the S is or before the is, actually, there is an S in the middle or in the start or the end. Just go ahead and search for it. Let's run this query and see the result ourselves. As you can see, we have now Sophia and Sergey like before, but we have Jessica because Jessica has two S's in the middle in here, which is pretty interesting. If I search for the A, I'm going to execute this. Wow, we have a lot of results in here. Sophia, there is an A at the end. Noah, there is A at the third place. Chang, Vladimir, all of them containing A. If I remove this one here, this means that I'm going to start with an A and then no matter what the rest of the word or the name is, and you're going to get me only Ali. So that's the only name that starts with an A. Okay, I know it can be a little bit confusing at the first, but it's really magical and very powerful in searching patterns if you'd like to search for a specific pattern as I'm doing in here. As you can see, only Ali starts with an A. No other names in A. If I removed it from here, so now I'm getting all names that contains an A anywhere but not the beginning. Okay? I know that this is a little bit confusing, but it's very powerful. I use this here a lot. The two wild cards, the percentage in the front and in the end, and what I need to search is in between. That's very common and very powerful for my opinion. Okay, that's it about the like and wild cards. Let's test your skills in the upcoming lecture. Okay, everyone, how about a new exercise? In this exercise, I need you to go ahead and select the film ID, the title, description, special features from the film and scale database. Select any movie that consists of two words. The first word starts with an A, and the second word starts with C. As you can see, we can use a like and the wildcard to search for this better. Pause the video, read this exercise carefully, and try to apply it. Okay, everyone, I hope it's easy. Let's go ahead and try to do this together. So I'm going first to use Sakila, and I'm going to select the film ID, the title, description, cut, 
and the special features column from fill let's test this going to run this okay it's working fine but we need to add the where clause so i'm going to add where the title like here the tricky board letter a it's the first letter of the first word then no matter what comes after it then a space and this is very important this space and the second word which is going to start with a c and no matter what the characters that follow the c let's execute this and here it is we have these movies we have aladdin calendar alien center american circus and etc a in the first word c in the second word okay i hope that you enjoyed this and see you in the next lecture